All right. Well, since we're recording, are we? Uh, do we think we're ready to start? Everybody hear me? Yeah, we could. Yeah, we hear you. All right. Okay. I'm, I'm never sure. This microphone has a separate mute on it that's independent from the from the computer. Uh, all right. Well, let's just go ahead and get started. People can wander in and wander out, and and uh, we know from the comments that we get that a lot of people listen to the recording next week or so. I get letters or email next week about things we talk about, especially from Michelle. If she's not here, is Michelle on tonight? Don't see her. Yeah, I don't see her. Anyway, my name is Bill Perkins, KB4KFT, and Rob hates to hear this, but I am the current president of the club. Uh, we do have elections every year. Uh, Y'all see the agenda that John has put up there. That's uh, that's really a pretty nice one. So let's just hit the let's hit the points going down. First, I'd like to thank everybody that showed up Saturday. Uh, we set up at Abbott's Bridge Park and did the Georgia State Parks on the air. Um, we had three radios up. I actually had four up if you count Fernando. He said he was going to try to join us tonight. Uh, we had four radios up and running. We had an assortment of radios, a Kenwood, a couple of Yezus, and an ICOM, and one of those G90s, which I got to help set up and operate, which is kind of an interesting radio. Uh, oh. Fernando had an in-fed, um, he called it an in-fed half wave, but when when we looked at it, it actually had a counterpoise, so it was an off-center fed dipole is what it really was. And uh, seemed to do pretty good. He chose to use his own call sign rather than W4DOC. And uh, for you guys that didn't show up, you, you missed a nice day in the park. The weather was perfect. The temperature was perfect. The, we had a few people wander by to see what we were doing. Uh, John made a lot of contacts. I made a few. Uh, mainly, we were there just to have a good time. So if you didn't show up for this one, uh, you kind of missed one. Uh, what do we got coming up? Uh, this coming weekend is the Lawrenceville Stone Mountain Ham Fest, whatever you want to call it. So uh, we will have a club table there, and everybody's welcome to come by and hang out and also up up your membership if you need to up it. Um, not much more to say about it. Everybody that knows the Stone Mountain Ham Fest knows it's, it's worth a drive, and there are some folks that come down from North Carolina and Tennessee uh, for this thing. So uh, this weekend, if you get a chance, come to the ham fest and come to the club table. Uh, John, have you checked out the restaurant for tomorrow since we're talking about changing the location or at least trying it? I, I haven't, uh, I, I can't remember if I've ever been there or not. And I think Ed, hopefully Ed can speak on what it's like there. Ed. Well, I, I haven't been there for a couple of months, but they, uh, really good Mexican food. Um, and really good lunch specials. So unless they've changed in the last few months, it's it's good. Will there be an area for us to kind of drag a few tables together? Do you know? Well, there's an outdoor seating area. Um, well, it's not outdoors. In the winter, they've got these plastic things that come down. You can see through them, but keeps it warm in there. And the tables are next to each other. So... Uh, it's not, even though you, there's no large tables, uh, you know, the other, the next table is right next to you. So, so we'll be able to talk. We'll, we'll so, give it a try and see how, how it works and if it might be a permanent solution or it might not, we'll see. Right. And during lunch, there's plenty of parking at night. The place is mobbed, but last time I was there at lunch, the lot was wide open. So the problem is that in Brookhaven with with uh, Fox Brothers and Chick Fil A, it's just gotten really bad in that parking lot, and that's even without all that driving in that area is pretty bad. So um, we'll see how it goes tomorrow. If it's not good, we'll we'll change. I remember the last few times that I was able to go to Mel a Mushroom. Just getting out of there back to work was an issue. You end up having to turn left onto that road so you can turn left on the Peachtree Industrial and cars are backed up 10 cars back. Um, and I, usually I did go right and go down to the subdivision there somewhere and turn around and come back rather than try to make a left turn out of there. So uh, maybe this, I'm going to give it a shot tomorrow, see if I can be there. I haven't made lunch in a while. And, and um, uh, we do uh, throw this out a little bit ahead of time, but we do try to do a special lunch on the Friday after Thanksgiving. 
And I uh, don't know what the plans for that is at this point. We'll throw that out as we get closer to it. But um, uh, like Ed says, this place looks like a good place, and I'm going to give it a crack tomorrow, and, and we'll see how it works out. Uh, what else we got coming up? Uh, we we got the Ham Fest coming up. The second Sunday in November would be the 13th, I believe. Uh, thir- I don't have a calendar here in front of me, but it, I think it'd be the 13th. Don't know what we're going to do if we're going to do an outing for the 13th since we got the Ham Fest the week before, but we'll see where that's going. Um, the yeah, second Sunday. I don't have the I don't have a calendar right here. It's, At least the, it's the 12th. The 12th, the third. Yeah, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, anyway, I don't know what we're going to plan for. We'll just get it closer and see what the weather is going to be. I wouldn't have any problem hitting Brook Run Park and sitting up on the hill up there again, but we'll just get closer to it and see. Um, and see, John's got the agenda up here on November the 11th, which would be the Saturday after the Ham Fest, the breakfast over at Goldberg's. Uh, if, if you guys have not done it, it's the breakfast is usually pretty good. I know it's early to get up on a Saturday morning and go out there, but I've, I've been a few times, uh, went the last one we did last month and it, it's, it's worth getting up and driving over there. It really is. Uh, the company is good. The food is good. And usually we're there before the crowd hits, so we have an El Primo table for the most part. Yeah, and I forgot to put on there, but we get there about uh, seven thirty. But if you get there at eight, that's great. Yeah, I mean, it's at that point we've got a table, so you'll have a place to sit if you get there. We can always drag a chair over. I'm pretty sure. Uh, second Sunday, yeah, we got November the twelfth. There it is. Yeah, it's okay. coming up. Uh, we we we're thinking about the park, but we'll just see what the weather is going to do. And I see John has the what three words on there. If you guys have not seen the the navigation application called What Three Words, look it up. Um, it's essentially GPS. It's almost the same thing as GPS coordinates, but, but it's more fun. That's the only thing I can say. Uh, bottom on the list, he has uh, John has also put on there the holiday party for December the seventh at the Mad Italian. Uh, John organizes these things. He's talked to the folks and it, it works out real good. It's, it's a little bit noisy, but that means we all get to sit close together so we can hear each other. And that's a once a year thing. And that takes, uh, that replaces the meeting for that month. So uh, December the 7th, put it on the calendar and, and certainly be there. Uh, John, do you have anything else to throw in? Not that I know of uh, re- uh, repeater reports. Stephen's not here tonight, but he said everything's functioning, and he had no report to give. So, yeah, it's not. That, it's pretty stable. Uh, Lynn, whose call sign I can never remember, KFV something brother. He's on tonight. Uh, we actually played with the repeater a little bit last night. Uh, the Gars repeater and the Atlanta repeater before um, W4DOC before the Southeast Link repeater net. The repeater net sounded like it went pretty good, and there's a lot of noise but for a change. The last time I was on that net, we were generating the noise. Now there were other club repeaters that were doing it. And uh, I was able to actually hit the machine from my house, which surprised me because I hadn't been able to hit the two-meter machine in a long time. Uh, in any event, uh, everything seemed to be going pretty good, and uh, we're, we're moving toward the holiday season. Uh, trying to find a location to start live meetings. And I heard y'all talk about that as I came on. Uh, I was talking to the, the, the new owner of the former Golden Corral in Brookhaven. And I thought that would be a good one because they usually have a side room that they can put the little accordion doors over and get us in there. And uh, he, he said that he was not interested at this point in booking his restaurant uh for a standing crowd on a thursday that he has enough crowd already on thursday so uh the the search goes on um if y'all remember the old joke they go to hotel and they say we're full and said look if the president showed up you'd find a room for him oh yeah well he's not gonna be here tonight so i'll take that room um that doesn't work for some of these guys so we'll we'll keep looking and find something pretty soon uh anybody got anything else they want to throw in tonight Speak up, hmm. Rob. I see, yeah, I see you waving your hand, Rob. I, yeah, no, 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 no. I was just checking to see if the if the uh, camera's working. Yeah, you got some kind of grass or something behind you there. It looks pretty funky, but yeah, you're I'm there. Simulating having fall, fallen down, and I'm in the grass <laughs> again. <laughs> and- 
Yeah, uh, inside joke, guys. Uh, Rob is not a fan of the place we go at Brook Run because every time he goes up here, he falls down. Even on dry grass, he falls down. That got me puzzled. City people. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Somebody started to say something. Oh, there's Lynn. Okay, yep. Rob, why don't you take it and introduce our speaker for the night, and uh, y'all run with it. KB4KFT, I'll be standing by. You're muted, Rob. Hey, Rob, we see your yeah, lips I got, I got, I got it. I think All I got it. right. I don't know how many of you uh, heard the presentation that we did last week. It was Tom Crowley talking about noise coming in from Jupiter and and other celestial sources. Um, and he said, you can't do anything about that. You know, Jupiter's there and it's doing what it's doing. Actually, it's 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 coming off of one of the moons. Um, so we have to put it up, put up with that. You know, there's a lot of and I guess that's 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 uh, QRN. Right, but there's a lot of noise out there that we can do something about. And Jeff is an expert in finding the noise from um, the radio frequency, the RFI coming in from devices that use electricity, devices like uh, power poles that that handle electricity um, from all over the place. And that keeps him <laughs> sure that keeps him busy. Um, he's been working, he's been fighting this for 15 years. So I, I think he's got it pretty well down pat. Um, he's from, uh, he worked for large, just for background, he, he worked for a large cell company. Uh, he also worked in telephone operations. So he's got the credentials too. He's got a double E, an MBA, <laughs> and he's a licensed engineer, a licensed PA. So He's going to be good, and he's. I'll I'll send this out afterwards. There's an article about him. Actually, was in the 2022 QST, and uh, I'll send out a link to that. But without further ado, let me turn this over to to Jeff Stuparitz. Uh Good evening, Jeff. Thanks, Rob. Glad to be back talking to the group again uh, on one of the topics I get involved with a lot, and. I think it's something that all of us will get involved in over the next few years because RFI is not getting better. It's getting worse with all the electronic uh, devices out there. So I'm going to share my screen. You should see a uh, map up there uh, on your screen now. And oops, let's see here. I got to, I think I got to click one of these things. See if I can enlarge this a little bit. There we go. Is that any better? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Looks Thanks. Good. If I uh, am not clear at some point, uh, you lose the picture, whatever, just remind me I need to click a new button. And one thing I need to do is click the more button and share sound. Okay, as Rob said, uh, my name is Jeff W4DD. I live up in Forsyth County. Been here for 25 years or so. I got involved in RFI probably about 15, 20 years ago, and I basically knew nothing. So I've kind of been through the school of hard knocks on uh, how to find most things. And uh, if nothing else, I'm a persistent person. You can reach me one of two ways, uh, either at the uh, W4DD at ARR.net or via the qrz.com webpage. So tonight we'll be talking about what is RFI? Do you have it? Uh, some tools that we'll use to find RFI, some simple tools and also some better tools. Uh, some examples, uh, some clearing distance guidelines. So we have an idea how far out we need to look for the RFI. And then some results I've achieved with my home station here over the last uh, 10 years or so. So what is RFI? It's an acronym. We have lots of acronyms. Radio frequency interference, very broad term used to describe an uh, undesired signal <clears throat> that interferes with reception of something you want to hear. The bad part about RFI is it raises the noise floor. And the higher the noise floor, the fewer signals you're going to hear. If the noise floor gets too high, you'll hear no signals. 
but if your noise floor is low, you hear even weak signals and they're very readable. Lots of uh, types of devices that generate uh, RFI. Uh, power lines and switching mode power supplies are the two most common. It's not unusual to have multiple devices in a home creating RFI. I'd say uh, just about every uh, ham station has a couple, whether you know they're there or not. And uh, sometimes they're severe, sometimes uh, you can uh, live with them. So power line noise. Uh, PLN is uh, radio frequency energy, energy created by a, uh, an arc on the power pole. It's unintended. The power company really doesn't want to have these things. Uh, it's between two metal conductors, and there's a lot of energy in a spark, as uh, we know from the old days when we used spark gap transmitters to com communicate across the Atlantic Ocean. So they can be quite effective if enough power is uh, pumped into them. The effectiveness of that spark gap transmitter is determined by two things, the intensity of the arc and also the antenna that it's uh, connected to or tuned to. That's kind of an important uh, uh, concept. In all of these RFI cases, there will always be a transmitter, so to speak, and an, a, an antenna, some kind of wire that does the transmission. If you take away either one of those two, you can uh, eliminate it or uh, minimize it. Uh, the noise, it can go from S1 you know, to S9 or 20 or 30 dB over S9, depending on how close it is to you. Lots of uh, common uh, causes for power line issues, uh, defective insulators, uh, defective lightning arresters, and metal-to-metal uh, -metal arcing on the pole. One characteristic of power line noise is it's usually wide band. So it extends from 160 meters well up through VHF and even into UHF, the 440 band. If anybody has any questions during the presentation, I'll be glad to uh, take them. If they're longer, we'll uh, postpone them till the end. Second uh, common cause of RFI is switching mode power supplies. They're very common now. Uh, they use them to power all kinds of things. The old linear type, which tend to be kind of heavy, weighing usually several pounds, have pretty much gone out of use uh, nowadays. There's uh, maybe less than 10% are the old linear types. Uh, the new uh, trend is to the SMPSs, which are very small, lightweight, and very inexpensive to, uh, to manufacture. Uh, they're more efficient, which is a good thing, but uh, with that efficiency comes more complexity, and that's where the problem comes in. They usually use a small transformer inside those uh, SMPSs, and that uh, transformer operates at a much higher frequency, usually around 15 to 50 kilohertz, uh, and it oscillates at that frequency, the oscillator oscillates that frequency, and the transformer can be very small and, and not very heavy. If they're not well designed, SMPSs can generate a lot of RFI. Uh, and usually it affects the low bands more severely than the high bands. So that's one of the characteristics that will distinguish the two uh, power line noise and the switching mode power supplies. So why do we care? Well, I took two snapshots here in my home station, uh, taking just a minute or so apart. The top one is 40 meters. I had an S7 noise floor. I counted 11 workable stations. And you can also see some other trash in there, some, some lines basically of some uh, spikes or spurs. That's kind of an indication that something's not quite right. The bottom snapshot is a minute later, 40 meters, the noise is gone. The noise floor is now S5 and there's 17 workable stations that I can easily pick out of the, uh, of the noise floor. So 50% increase in stations I could hear by lowering the noise floor by two S units to about 12 dB. And that's why it's important. And in many cases, if the other station has a low noise floor, they can easily copy you and, and work you. And I'm for the folks doing POTA, uh, you can really appreciate they go out into a park where it's usually pretty quiet. And their noise floor is nice and low. So they can work a lot of stations. So, and hopefully the far end has a low noise floor and they can hear the low power uh, POTA stations. So do you have RFI? Well, you power up your HF radio, you pick your band and antenna of choice, you find an unused frequency, usually best to switch over to AM mode with a six kilohertz filter. What you should hear is a nice, pleasant, uh, low level white noise. 
You should not hear any kind of buzzing or anything that sounds uh, uh, man-made. If you have a pan adapter, you can look at that and also see some uh, odd things versus a nice, you know, flat, uh, low noise floor across the bottom. So if you see something that doesn't look right, you may have RFI and you need to do some more investigation. So here's an example. And you can kind of see that it's pretty strong in this case. This has taken a, a power pole near my home uh, some years back. It's uh, about S9 plus 10 or 15 dB, very strong. You can hear some variation in it. It's not always perfectly the same like you might expect from a switching mode power supply. Uh, and it's got that characteristic 60 hertz buzz. So one of the first things I ask people when they uh, contact me is uh, what bands are affected because many times you need to learn as much as you can about the RFI in order to solve the problem. So it helps to understand, is this a low band problem? Is this a one band only problem? I mean, if it's only on, for instance, 80 meters, it may not be power line noise. It may not even be a normal switching mode power supply. It may be some kind of oscillation in a power supply. So information like that will help you determine um, one of the characteristics of the noise. Is it just roll off with frequency or is it pretty flat all the way through the HF bands? And it'll also tell you if you can hear it on 10 meters, you can probably hear it up at uh, two meters or 137 megahertz. And that's a really good place to chase uh, noise because the antennas are small and they can be very directional. The second uh, question I usually ask is if you have a directional antenna. Uh, if you do, you can take 12 readings every 30 degrees as you rotate the antenna and narrow down where it is you need to look. Um, this helps tremendously. And if you have, you know, maybe three elements or four elements or five elements on a rotatable platform of some kind, you can get pretty specific to within maybe plus or minus a few degrees or plus or minus five degrees and put that vector on a uh, uh, Google uh, Earth map and get a very good idea where the noise might be. I mean, you still have to go out and do some investigation, but uh, filling out a chart like this helps a lot if you have a rotatable antenna. And I've used this, uh, I don't know, probably hundreds of times with folks. And I like to think of the problem is, is a northeast quadrant problem? Is it a southeast quadrant problem? At least break it down into a quadrant if you can. And sometimes you can do that with the, the uh, VHF Yagi we'll talk about in a few minutes, but it, it helps to get an idea. Hey, it's from this general direction. Here's where I need to look versus you know, looking across the whole circle. So some simple tools and techniques. If, you, if you're new to RFI hunting, here are the things you can do with really not much effort. One is the circuit breaker test where you turn off the circuit breakers in your house, turn all of them off, power your radio off a battery, or if you can't power it off a battery, power it off a circuit that has only one or two things on it. And you monitor your HF radio. And when you flip them all off, if the noise didn't go down, it's not in your house. It eliminates things pretty fast. If it did go down, then you flip the breakers on one at a time uh, to see if the noise comes from that breaker. And if it does not come from a breaker, you turn the breaker off and go to the next breaker. Uh, it, there could be cumulative noise, so you always want to do one breaker at a time. You don't want one circuit to be hiding the noise from another circuit. You would like to find all the circuits with the, uh, the noise on it. That works pretty well if the noise is inside your house or maybe your neighbor's house. Uh, the second useful tool is a portable AM radio. You can walk around the house, the neighborhood. It gives you an idea of where you might want to look, uh, but it, it's not real exact. It does not provide magnitude of the source, and it doesn't provide a real good location either, but it does give you an idea, like I think it's in this area. And the third way to do it is AM car radio. You can drive around listening for the noise. And again, that doesn't provide magnitude of the noise, so it's a little hard to decide sometimes. Sometimes noise sounds really bad, but then you find out, hey, this is really only a 3 dB or a 6 dB noise. It's really not significant uh, because it's a quarter mile or half mile from my house. So um, 
you know, it'll give you a general idea. They're, they're simple tools. And one of the things you have to consider is the noise could be something small, uh, very close to your QTH, or it could be something big farther away. And you, you really don't know what it is until you find it. You have to kind of evaluate all of the uh, noise sources. So here are some much better tools, the ones I use uh, most often. The first one is a 137 megahertz Yagi uh, coupled with an HT and also a, a 45 dB attenuator. Uh, it can find things easily within blocks of my house or even out to a quarter mile. Uh, if you're only gonna build one tool, this is the tool because it's the, the crescent wrench of RFI hunting tools. A, a three element uh, Yagi for 137 megahertz is a really good antenna. You know, it's maybe 20 dB front to back, has pretty good gain gives you uh, an idea of uh, both direction and magnitude. You can use the attenuator to measure the magnitude. So it's really a great tool. And I use mine uh, every time I go out on an RFI uh, issue. The second uh, useful tool is an ultrasonic dish. Um, that's useful once you find the power pole causing the problem, and then you can ID the, the part on the power pole. It's an audio device, it provides uh, magnitude and uh, direction or the hardware ID of the problem on the pole. And it, uh, it has its limitations, but it's you know, 80, 90% uh, accurate in finding issues. There are a few exceptions, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And the third tool I use is something called RFI Mapper. Uh, RFI Mapper is some software I wrote about uh, eight years ago that allows me to go out and drive a route, collect data points, put them on a map and see where the noise is located. And that tells me where to look and also where not to look. So it's kind of a time saver. And I almost always use that usually because by the time I get involved in something, it's not a simple problem. It's more, uh, more complex. Question, please. Sure. If you don't mind. So you mentioned the ultrasonic dish and um, um, I'm assuming that that's portable. What, what does that look like? Good question. We'll have a picture in just a second or two. Okay. If I don't uh, hit uh, all of your points, just let me know. So uh, the mapper program provides uh, both location and magnitude, along with some other information like the elevation of the pole. That can be important if you're driving a route and you go down in a valley and there's a noisy pole. That's probably not going to radiate very far being down in a you know gully or something like that. But if it's on a hill, then it's a different concern. You might hear that pull from quite a long distance away. This is all line of sight, sight kind of stuff for the most part. So here's a picture of my uh, prototype uh, VHF Yagi. I built this maybe 15 or 20 years ago as a kind of a test when I was first getting started in RFI hunting. Uh, and my intent was to rebuild it and make it prettier, but it works so good I just left it as is and it, it does everything I could possibly ask of it. Um, it's a great tool. I couple it with a Yaesu VX5R set to AM mode, and I use it at 137 megahertz. We'll talk about that in a second. I'd say it's essential for finding local noise one at a time, or if you're going to assist the power company on a problem. It really is going to tell you quite, quite quickly uh, what pole it is you need to be looking at. Uh, you can build it on a three quarter inch PVC. That's what most people do. This is an old broomstick. Like I said, it was a prototype and it's kind of ugly, but uh, works really well. It didn't cost me anything to build because I had some old 10-3 uh, solid copper wire laying around the house. And I just uh, drilled out the, uh, the broomstick and added a piece of coax and away we went. I also had in my junk box an old cable TV attenuator. Um, that wasn't functional, the switches were no good. So I ripped that apart and put in new slide switches and different resistors to make it 50 ohms. So I repurposed that and there's a picture of it on the right-hand side. Some people build their attenuators. Um, you can go to eBay and buy them for about 25 bucks or so. And uh, any of those ways work just fine. So a question I frequently get is why use 137 megahertz or I use 136.950 just inside that aircraft band? Well, you wanna use AM 
for finding noise. You get, you're going to be able to hear the noise much more clearly than trying to decipher what's going on uh, in upper sideband or some other mode. So you want to use AM where possible. And some handy talkies only do AM in the aircraft band. You cannot enable AM mode in the two meter band, for instance. It won't let you do that. Some will, but some won't. So that's why I pick the aircraft band. The second point is HTs will not transmit in the aircraft band. So if you accidentally depress the PTT button, you don't burn up the resistors in your attenuator. That would not be a good thing to do if you were out with a power company helping them and you happen to hit the PTT and your attenuator smoked and smoke poured out of the side of it. It wouldn't demonstrate to them you know what you're doing. <laughs> That's one of the things you, you definitely want to do. So. Uh, I just play it safe. I go to the aircraft van when I do RFI hunting and uh, the attenuator safe. I've, I've yet to, uh, to, to burn it up. And those small resistors, I think they're eighth watt, don't take much to cook them. They, they go really fast. Uh, VHF provides really good range and good pull resolution. Some folks use uh, UHF 440. Uh, I've tried that, but I didn't get the range I wanted to. I like uh, working down on VHF. And I usually pick a frequency just inside the aircraft band. It works pretty good. Usually isn't uh, much traffic at the very top of the band. So hints for using the HT Yagging attenuator. I'd say it's a must have if you're gonna work with a power company. Uh, it's, it's a, I call it the crescent wrench of tools uh, for RFI hunting. The noise loudness is not always indicative of RF levels. So I've had noise that sounds really bad, but when I actually measure the uh, level of the noise by flipping in attenuators until it goes away. So I, I can flip in three dB or six dB or uh, 12 dB. And at some point that noise will fade into just the noise of the handy talky uh, internal noise. That's the way to measure the noise. The S meter is on, the HTs are really lousy and they're difficult to see many cases. And noise can sound nasty, but you find out, hey, it's really only a three dB noise and it's located a quarter mile away from my house. That's not a concern. So you kind of scratch that off the list. You don't get sidetracked and, and step into rabbit holes. Over the last 10 or so years, I've kind of developed a scale I use for myself to rate a noise. So if I can get rid of the noise when I'm using the Yagi with zero to 12 dB, it's on the small scale. It's gonna to have to be pretty close to my, uh, my QTH for me to hear it. If it's 13 to 24, it's kind of medium. It can be a little farther away, maybe uh, up to a quarter mile. If it's 25 to 40, that's a, a pretty big noise source. I need to consider, hey, this thing could propagate a half mile or more. And if it's more than 40 dB, that is, a huge noise source and many times it's indicative of a bad lightning arrestor which is probably the nastiest noise source you can get on a pole. A couple of uh, points I've learned basically by stepping in, in rabbit holes. Poles with lots of high voltage lines may seem to cause the noise but it may be an adjacent pole with one high voltage wire on it. So you have to kind of consider that when you're doing an A-B comparison if the poles are very different. One thing I've learned is if I stand midway between the two poles and do an A-B comparison, uh, I'll almost always get the, the proper pole. And I've had to relearn that a number of times uh, out in the field where I biased it too heavily towards one pole and it turns out, no, that wasn't the real pole. If I would have gotten midway between the two poles and did a fair A-B comparison, it would have led me right to the, the problem pole. Okay, a uh, question about the dish. Here's the dish I built some uh, time ago. Uh, hams will usually take care of the RF locating and the power company will handle the ultrasonic uh, part of it. They can buy a commercial disc. It's about $3,000 made by radar engineers. Really great device, well-made, uh, works fantastic, uh, but it's $3,000. But you want to make sure you can get the power company to the right pole. If you can't do that, the odds of getting it fixed uh, go down severely. So you get them to the right pole. Most power companies, I'd probably say uh, two thirds have uh, ultrasonic dishes where they'll bring the dish out. Either an engineer comes out or uh, the line crew comes out with the dish. They'll scan the pole and they'll be able to locate the defective part on it. And 
companies are getting better over time. Uh, Cobb EMC here in Atlanta just bought a couple of dishes and they've been doing a little training with it and uh, they're coming along really nice. I, I'm really impressed with uh, the work they're going through. If you want to build one as a ham, um, it's no small task. You definitely want to build the Agi first because that's going to be the pole finder. Um, the dish is going to take you a while and on a dish there's three parts. One is the uh, parabolic uh, dish, the actual physical dish. Uh, you, you can buy those for about a hundred bucks. Uh, I can send you the information, but you want a quality dish because that's the reflector and that's going to provide the gain. And these dishes have about 40 dB of gain. The uh, second thing is the electronics. Uh, that's important, of course, to have good electronics. And the third is you want a good sighting system. And I mounted a 1X scope on mine and it can be pretty precise. I can usually uh, resolve down to plus or minus three or four inches which most cases gets me pretty close. So it's, it's like I said, no small project to build a good dish, a lot of work. And there's a way to test these things too. There's a spark uh, uh, plug tester. Uh, I have the information in one of my, uh, my handouts I can send you uh, on eBay. They're about $25 and you can take this uh, spark plug tester and put a spark plug in it and it makes a spark and the, you know, the dish will hear it. So you can align the dish very accurately using that uh, detector. Did that uh, hit your questions? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. If you want more information, drop me an email and I'd be glad to answer them. So what does power pole hardware look like? Here's a picture of a very simple single phase power pole. And you see the high voltage line at the top. In this case, my local utility runs 14 kV versus 7 kV. Um, and that's generally more problematic uh, because the higher the voltage, the more issues you tend to have. There's a pole top insulator at the top. Um, there's a lightning arrestor. There's a, a fuse that's held in place by a, uh, an insulator. The, the narrow white thing is the fuse. Uh, there's a bell insulator that feeds downstream usually to, towards the house or the next pole. And of course, there's a neutral wire that uh, uh, is reference for all this stuff. Uh, one word of warning, when a power pole is under some kind of a fault condition, you don't always know exactly what that fault is. It's making noise, obviously, but let's say uh, there was an arc over to the guy wire uh, and the guy wire was corroded and not having a good ground. If you were to touch that guy wire, it could have potentially thousands of volts on it. So you can, uh, you can look, but don't touch. It's always the best policy when you're working on power line stuff. Reminds me of uh, in engineering school, one of the uh, classes was the instructor would give you a box. Inside the box was electronic components. You could not open the box, but you had to characterize what was inside and make a drawing of what was inside without ever seeing it. So you, you got to measure the ins and the outs any way you wanted to, but you could not open it up. Uh, and the same applies to uh, power pole hardware. Look, but don't touch. So if you were to find a, a, a noisy pole and you're pretty confident it's a pole, what do you do? Well, you have to open up a trouble ticket with your power company. Sometimes that goes very smoothly. Sometimes it takes a little, little bit of work. Um, if there are multiple issues, you want to pr prioritize the issues. You want to pick the two or three worst poles. And many times that's the case. There might be five or six poles causing problems, but you really want to get the big hitters first. And, you don't want to give them 20 things to fix because they're not going to be too interested in doing that. You need to build some credibility, you know, work the problem poles, uh, things improve. And then if you still need to go back and do some more work with them, they're going to be more agreeable to doing that. Uh, you don't need to find every noisy pole in the city. And I've had people say, well, I'm just going to, you know, find them all and turn them all in. Uh, that's going to get you nowhere with a power company. They're, they're trying to, provide a service and make money and they're not interested in, in fixing every uh, small uh, issue on every power pole in the city. Usually they'll have a uh, ultrasonic detector, the Raider Engineers 250 or 251. That'll help things move things along pretty good if you can get them down the pole. They just show up, they scan the pole and say, yeah, it's the arrest or whatever. And it's always good to be on site, uh, offer to be on site. Sometimes they want you there, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they working on a schedule where they can tell you they're going to be out there at 8 a.m. and 
Other times they show up when they have a opening in their schedule. If the information you give them um, is accurate, uh, you will build uh, some credibility and the next time you have to work with them, it'll be much, much better. Uh, one thing I didn't do here, let me just, let me just back up, so it's 18. So here's a picture of the power pole and I'm gonna shop, stop sharing for a second. And just show you some parts. Here's a pole top insulator. This thing probably weighs six or seven pounds. I mean, it's, it's really massive and there's a slot at the top where the, the heavy line uh, lays in there and they tie wrap it down to this uh, um, circle area here that's indented somewhat. Let me see if I can get a better picture so you can see it. Uh, you can wrap a wire around this and then tie it to the line and then tie the line down to the pole top. But this thing is heavy duty. I mean, this has got to stand up to 14,000 volts and actually more than that because it's 14,000 RMS, which means it really peaks at about 20,000 volts. But big heavy duty stuff, sometimes these get cracked. I've seen pieces chipped off. I've seen holes punched in them before. It's not a real common fault, but it does happen. And the other thing uh, really interesting is the lightning arrestor. And you can see, let me put it over here. This thing has some fins on it. These, this is the new lightning arrestor, the new style. These fins are rubbery. And that's important for a reason. Uh, when these things malfunction, let me, let me back up a little bit. The older style of lightning arresters were made of porcelain. The porcelain uh, is of course a very hard material. And when those would arc over, they, they snap as you'd expect. It's kind of like a, a high voltage uh, spark when you walk across a carpet and you hear the snap. That snap, when it occurs inside of a porcelain arrestor, can easily be transmitted to the outside shell of the arrestor. And you can hear that on the ultrasonic detector. No problem. It, it'll usually just blow your socks off. It'll be so loud. These newer uh, arrestors are rubber coated. It is very difficult to hear uh, through this rubber coating. The ultrasonic noise is being generated when that spark takes place or that uh, little snap takes place is very difficult to hear with the detector. The only way I've been successful in hearing it in the very bottom, there's a bolt. And if I point at that bolt, I can hear a very light snap. And that's my key that this new arrestor is bad. The only other way to find them is if they just cut the power off to it and then replace the uh, arrestor. But they're a little tricky to work on. Um, and I've had a couple of interesting cases where it was difficult to, uh, to uh, locate them and it takes a little persistence. So. If you do use an ultrasonic detector or if they use theirs, you can't always detect the, uh, the newer style lightning arresters. Just wanted to make that point in case you, you're out working with them sometime. So the third uh, tool I use uh, pretty much every time I go out on a problem is something called RFI Mapper. Uh, this is an example of a map I did maybe about three or four years ago. You can kind of see there were two major problems here and one minor problem. You can see quite a large area of RFI pollution. As I drove down these roads, this red is still a pretty hot level. And we'll talk about that a little more. So why did I need a new tool? Well, I had about 10 years of uh, trying to solve PLN problems here. I'm in a relatively rural area, but um, there's still plenty of power lines around and they were somewhat aged in some cases. Sometimes they were big, sometimes small, uh, sometimes constant. Those are a little easier to find, sometimes intermittent. Uh, and of course you get the, it only uh, happens when it's cold or it's hot or it's wet or it's dry. And I can recall trying to hunt power line noise problems when the wind's blowing 20 miles an hour and the temperature is 20 degrees and that's never any fun that my HF beam, and I had a little three element at the time, gave me a general direction, but that typically was not good enough. And there was still too many poles in the, in the total base of things I'd have to look at. It was very tedious walking around, trying to find it with the Yagi and HT. And that was before I added an attenuator to my HT. So it was really confusing. Multiple poles would sound strong. Sometimes uh, the noise only is in the HF range and you have to hunt it there. So that's another complicating factor. Uh, so after a, 
probably about 10 years of work. I could never really get my noise under control for too long. Just too many sources. And uh, my pers my uh, final straw was a persistent S9 plus 10 noise to the southeast and an S6 to the west that I could not locate. And I worked with my power company guy for uh, a couple of days out in the field walking around and we found problems, but they never seemed to be significant enough to cause my problem. So this is back in 2015. I just got frustrated and said I need a different approach because what I was doing was not working. So another case of you, you step in rabbit holes and trying to find ways to work, uh, work around them. So back at Christmas time in 2015, I bought a GPS and wrote some beta code to collect S meter data. So what I ended up with was something I call RFI mapper. It provides a color coded map. We'll look at that in a few minutes. It'll show the location and the strength of the noise. So it gives me both magnitude and location or direction. Uh, I can usually identify down to the pretty close to the pole as I'm drive a route, the laptop's going to record the S meter level and it'll also announce the S meter level every uh, 10 seconds and any time the level goes above S9. And then once you get the general area where to look and also where not to look, uh, you can go out with the HT uh, Yagi and the dish and narrow down and confirm the exact pole. It's also, uh, I find a very convincing evidence for the power company. Usually when I send them a map and say, here's what the noise level looks like, and here's what I think, and kind of walk them through the process, they're usually pretty good, good about responding. I mean, it's not going to be a wild goose chase. The noise is in this area. So we'll talk about a few examples. Uh, and what you'll see is uh, a group of colors that range from cold to hot colors. You can see the scale on the left-hand side. I've extended the S meter scale above S9. So S9 is an S9 plus zero. S10 is six dB more than that. S11 is 12 dB more and so on up. So it's all in a relative S meter scale. One of the things um, this uh, system gives you is it'll tell you the number of counts you get in each category. So you can see that there was one S13, which was a pretty hot level. There were 12 S12.3 levels and you can kind of work down this list and you can click on these actual numbers and it'll highlight the locations you had those noise levels on the map. So it's a pretty flexible system. And so here's a, the first example I'm gonna talk about. Uh, my QTH is in the upper left-hand corner, way in the upper left-hand corner, like uh, two or three screens off this map. And I had this noise to the Southeast that was just some days it was 20 dB over S9. We spent a couple of days in the upper left-hand corner of this area. And you can see some orange up here from, from noise sources. And we worked on three or four of them and the problem never went away. And I'm just going like, what's going on? So finally, I just got so frustrated. I said, I needed to have a different approach because I'm not making progress. And keep in mind, this is when I was first starting out with uh, RFI hunting. So I said, okay, I'm going to write some beta code. I'm going to collect data without interpreting the data. I'm just going to collect the data and then let's see where the data le leads me. So I collected uh, a bunch of data with the beta code. And as soon as, actually my wife was with me on this uh, trip down, she was manning the laptop. Uh, as soon as I got down this uh, one road, uh, kind of the middle of the page here, got down near the end, even she knew that was the source of the problem. It was just going nuts. The laptop was announcing the S meter level every single second. It was S12, S13. And I realized this is where the problem was. And also of interest was there's some other noise here, a little bit to the right of that, but that's on a lower ridge line. I never could hear that. So when we fixed the primary noise because this uh, other noise was lower and being blocked by basically dirt and rocks, I never heard that, but this area was noisy and one noise in particular was really uh, troublesome. So what was the cause? It was this bolt. The bolt passed through a power pole uh, and as it passed through, it was in contact with another piece of metal, a bracket. And the two were apparently at different potentials because arcing from one to the other and the bolt is about 50% eaten through eventually it would have gone all the way through that uh, bolt and the bolt would have broken off and the cross arm support would have uh, uh, 
released. Uh, and the lineman went up there, he said he could smell something burning. It was a creosol in the pole or the preservative. They replaced this, they re-drilled the, the mounting arrangement and bam, my noise level went from an S9 plus 10 down to an S3. <clears throat> so uh, huge improvement. We finally found it after you know, searching for months. So although the most common problems are like the bell insulators, the pole tops or lightning arrests, or sometimes you get a really odd one. This is in that category of really odd. Here's uh, another example. Uh, I drove this route for actually a power company <clears throat> man. He was having some problems with another ham, asked me to take a look at it. And we're gonna take a look at this area up here in the, in the top, these two blue stars. So you can see that uh, driving south on the road, you can see some dots that are strung together and you see the level increase and you see a blue star, which was the peak. And then driving out of the area, you see the same kind of thing. There was one blue star was the peak. And between the blue stars was this pole on the left-hand side, which you can see pretty well with uh, Google Maps. And uh, that pole was pretty uh, high level emitter. And uh, we identified it. It was a pole top insulator. They replaced it. Noise went away. So sometimes you can get pretty accurate with the uh, RFI mapper system. Sometimes, I would say more times than not, it, it gets you in the area, but you still have to identify the pole. Um, third case and the final one we'll talk about to save a little time. I had a uh, pretty good noise floor. This is after a couple of years of work to the Southwest. And all of a sudden uh, after a storm, thunderstorm, it got really bad to the Southwest. So I went out and drove this route and you can see this is a really noisy area and the side road is just totally polluted with uh, RF interference. Um, I went out uh, after I did this map, the peak levels were here highlighted where you see the black dot with the white circles. Went out with the Yagi, did some AB pole comparisons. And while I was out there, um, the police officer from the middle school came out and said, uh, I had some reports of of parents said there's somebody out here doing some weird stuff. And I thought, man, this is gonna be a problem. Uh, so he came over, talked to me for a little bit and said, what are you doing? And I explained to him, I'm a ham radio operator. I live in the next subdivision over. I'm trying to locate some RF interference to my ham station. And I've got it narrowed down to this pole. And I, I said, it appears to be the lightning arrester. And he gave me the strangest look. And after about 15 seconds of the strange look, he says, is, is this why my police handy talkie doesn't work when I'm directing traffic in front of the school? And I said, yes, sir, that's exactly right. I says, the interference is so intense, uh, it's, it's blocking the signal and uh, your handy talkie operates very close to the frequency I'm using for this listening device. And I always like to let the police officer hear what I'm hearing, kind of add some, uh, substance to the discussion. He could hear what's going on. And he said, no problem. He turned around, walked away and, and left me alone. But uh, expect to get a few of those questions every now and then. Pretty much every time I've been questioned by a police officer, they've been more knowledgeable than I thought they would be. Uh, in one case, I explained what we were doing and the officer said, uh, oh yeah, this is what we use to track people with ankle bracelets. I said, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. It's RF direction finding. So they're actually pretty knowledgeable on some of this stuff. This is the fourth example. I'm not gonna go into this, but uh, you can kind of see that RFI mapper got me in the area and within uh, 50 feet of these uh, black circles and star uh, was the problem. And it was a, it's called a recloser and it does uh, basically a circuit breaker function. So uh, how does the RFI mapper operate? Well, it's kind of similar to what cell phone companies done for about 30 years. I first got introduced to it about 30 years ago. They use it a little differently though. They're, they're locked onto a cell site looking at the RF level from that cell site. In the case of RFI mapper, we just want to look at the noise floor. So I don't want a signal. I want no signal. And I want to keep track of what the noise floor is. So what happens is every one second, the GPS sends 
uh, lat long to the laptop, a GPS will do that automatically. You don't have to do anything. Uh, that triggers the software to ask the S meter reading from the radio. So GPS sends data exactly at every one second, uh, along with the lat long. Um, the software then reads the S meter, records that lat long and S meter reading into a file. It also records the elevation provided by the GPS. So you know what the elevation of that pole is too, which can be important when you interpret uh, some of the data. It'll do 60 samples in a minute because it's doing one sample every second. Uh, if you drive for 30 minutes, it's about 1800 data points. And in 30 minutes, if you're driving 20 miles an hour, you can do about 10 road miles of data. So you can cover a lot of territory and get a pretty good overall picture of what the noise floor looks like in an area. And it's quite handy. Um, and we'll talk about the clearing distance and, uh, guidelines in a few minutes. But if you have a, a, a real effective antenna that uh, you know, can hear out a mile or so, those kind of noise problems are hard to find unless you have some kind of tool to give you the big picture. The mapping function is actually done with Google My Maps, which is not the same as Google Maps. Really easy to learn. Takes me maybe about 10 minutes to map a, a file out and uh, you can have 10 layers in the file, in, in the, the directory, so to speak. Each one is 2000 data points. So I can have up to 10 different passes over the course of a year in a particular area, I can click on the layers, turn them on and off. Hardest part is you have to set up a mobile installation and get that working. So uh, block diagram wise, what does the RFI mapper look like? Really simple, laptop computer, an HF transceiver, and I use an old TS-690 that I've had around for many years. It works really well. It's not fancy at all in a GPS. Uh, these GPSs were $30, now they're almost uh, 45 or 50 but just three components really. My transceiver is so old, I needed a couple of extra things. I needed to convert the USB to RS-232, and I needed to convert the RS-232 to TTL logic level, which is 5 volts. So a couple of extra devices for my setup, but many of the newer um, systems have direct RS-232 interface or USB interface. So what did things look like? When I first started, this uh, is kind of a picture, a map I did, and you can see why I was having problems, but there's I think it's a total of six different areas here that were problematic, that were really generating high levels of noise. I have them circled. Um, and some of them are very close, some of them are farther away, but a stronger level. So it can be either one of the two. By about a year and a half later, here's what that same map looked like. And you can see the case we just talked about here by the middle school where the lightning hit the pole in front of the school, knocked out the arrestor. Uh, we uh, cleared that and now this area was actually green, but definitely a, an improvement. Uh, we, we cleared the other noises, things uh, in a year and a half, it improved a lot. So does RFIM uh, work? Yep, I've been using it for uh, eight years now and really have found thousands of PLN sources. Uh, like I said, really, it's it's useful for a wide area uh, tool. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but uh, it's, it's not, you know, if, if the problem is within a block of your house, you probably don't need anything like this. Once the trouble is cleared, uh, noise level should go down at your QTH. Otherwise, you didn't identify the right noise source. New map shows green. Very useful for working with a power company, showing them, yeah, your work paid off. Look how good it looks. Thanks a lot. Um, it reduced my noise level from over S9 in uh, several directions to S2 or less. And at one time, my northeast direction was uh, down to less than S2, which was about an S1 and SSB mode. So it was really a good, had a few more issues since then. It's now up to about an S2, but still quite acceptable. The main things I work on now are intermittents and uh, things that pop up during hot, cold or wet weather or whatever. Or, Occasionally lightning damage. We'll get a few lightning strikes during the summer. Always causes a few problems and need to go out and find them. I mentioned a clearing distance guidelines uh, before, and this is the, the kind of the general guide I use uh, when I think about uh, RFI problems. If the ham's using wire antennas and they're at 30 feet or so, you're gonna have to clear noise sources out to a quarter mile, you know, typically they're going to be relatively close. They may be out a little farther if it's really a nasty one, 
but most of the time they're going to be within a quarter mile. If you're running a three element beam at 50 feet, you're probably going to have to clear to at least a half a mile away because you're going to hear that the, the beam is providing gain in a certain direction. That'll make the noise seem louder, just like it makes the DX station seem louder. And if you have a multi element YAG at 100 feet, you're going to probably have to clear to well beyond a mile. Uh, and depending on terrain, if a pull is down on a, a gully, you're not going to hear it. But if it's up on a hill, you're going to hear it. Uh, I run 10 meters most of the time where I have a five elements at 90 feet. And if not blocked by terrain, I can routinely hear the bigger emitter noise sources like the bad arresters out to over a mile. The uh, longest confirmed distance was 1.7 miles. That was the first example I talked about. Um, that was down a creek valley and it was S9 plus at my QTH and S13 on RFI mapper. Longest suspect issue was a pull three miles away. That was on a 200 foot hill. And you know, I talked to my um, power company guy <clears throat> and mentioned what I wanted him to do to change an arrestor out. He says, I thought you told me you could only hear out to two miles. And I said, well, that's true. But this is a special case. This pulls on a 200 foot hill, which makes it line of sight to my 100 foot tower. And sure enough, as soon as they changed that arrestor out, the noise went away and things were totally quiet to the Northwest. So that was the right source. So what noise level is normal? Uh, I took the ITU specification kind of compared to what I see and, and 80 meters, about an S6 is pretty normal noise level. 20 meters, about an S4. And 10 meters, you know, about an S2, maybe a little better some days. Those are pretty typical uh, numbers. Oops. One thing to, you know, one thing to uh, keep in mind, and this is the principle by which we all operate and uh, our FI mapper operates and the Yagi operates is, there's something called free space path loss. And we don't need to know how to work this formula, but it describes the signal level based on distance. And the important thing for us is D, the distance is a squared uh, variable. It's inside this, this bracket. Well, when you square something and you do a log function of that, kind of an interesting thing, what happens is when distance is a squared variable, you cut the distance in half to a, a noise source, the signal goes up by 6 dB. You double the distance to a noise source and the signal goes down by 6 dB. So if you move a noise source away from your house, say from 50 to 100 feet, assuming you're in the far field of the, the uh, uh, EM wave, you're going to reduce that noise by 6 dB and hopefully your DX station is still going to be the same level because you barely changed the distance to him. So one of the things I always emphasize for folks is whenever possible, use that to your advantage. And this is the principle by, by which uh, the Yagi works when you're you know, kind of have in the distance and walk towards a noise source, the noise gets louder. Uh, it's how RFI mapper works as you close the distance to a noise source, the noise keeps going up by a predictable level. And the same thing when you're placing an antenna at your house, it's usually best not to place that antenna directly over your house because you have noise sources, probably a dozen or more inside the house. And if you get close enough to them, they're gonna affect your noise floor. You wanna get that antenna away from your house and away from your neighbor's houses too, uh, if possible. So it's something to consider when you're, you're placing antennas and doing work. So how about, uh, we talked about power line noise a lot. How about internal noise sources? When I started doing some investigation. I had a few internal noise sources in my house. The noisiest of which was my router group and primarily the router. Uh, it was pretty noisy using the little Yagi thing. I measured it at uh, plus 21 dB when I was standing five feet away. That's pretty significant. We had a uh, LCD coffee pot, which was kind of hot too at a plus 18. And we had a Dynex TV at a plus 12. So two of the things we could unplug when not being used in the uh, router group, we used some ferrites on those uh, cords, the power cord that goes into the unit and also the cables exiting the unit. So uh, main takeaway, distance is your friend. You wanna stay away from these things with your antennas if you, uh, at all possible. 
a few lessons learned on switching mode power supplies, they can be very noisy and you'll find them easily with your three element Yagis who walk around the house and point at things. I wouldn't be surprised if you found one, two or three uh, noisy uh, SMPSs around. And then the next question is what to do about it. We'll talk about that in a minute. One thing I learned is uh, for my router, it, it really didn't have a ground connection. It just had the router, which is a plastic slash metal case. It had a wall wart, um, two wire, 12 volt uh, wall wart that plugged in, which was noisy. I put a fair right on that, very close to the actual wall, wall wart uh, power supply. I also wanted the router in. But another thing I did was I added a cable, a shielded cable, ethernet cable between the router and the cable modem. The cable modem had a ground because it has RG6 coming into it. But the router does not have that connection to ground. When I added the, the shielded cable between the two, it's only about a three footer. Uh, that helped my noise also by four or five dB. So something to consider, you look at the configuration and you, you have to think about it a little bit and say, you know, what's going on here? What's the transmitter and what's the antenna? Because like I mentioned before, there's two parts to these the RFI problem. One is either turn off the transmitter or turn off the antenna part of it. Uh, one thing I discovered while doing all this, um, I scratched my head a bunch. I bought some uh, shielded ethernet cables uh, off of a common internet site and they were not, they looked good, but the shield wire was not soldered to the metal shell. And there's a metal shell that goes around the RJ45 on the ethernet cable. And when I started measuring the resistance on those shells, it was all over the place. It'd go from two to 20 ohms, sometimes it'd jump up to 40 ohms. And I discovered that, hey, that drain wire that provides the shielding for the cable, they just laid it across the metal shell. There was no solder. So it's like taking a PL259, you know, sticking the braid inside the PL259, but never soldering the braid to the uh, the connector, it's not going to make good good contact. So I changed out to Amphenol cables. You can get them at uh, Mouser and many other places. So I was able to shave two S units off my 80 meter noise floor. And actually S5 is the band noise. Uh, uh, some days the band noise goes really low, like down to S3. And I can hear that decrease all the way down to S3. So it seems to be working pretty well. When you run across cases of um, switching mode power supply, RFI. Uh, one usually very effective way to, to, to aid that is uh, ferrites. You can see I put a couple on the two. Uh, one is a cable modem cable. The other is the router cable at the power supply. And that confines the energy, the RFI energy to the unit. It stops it from using the cable as the antenna. You still have the transmitter, so to speak, but it can no longer effectively use the cable as the antenna. Uh, I listed the four different types I use. One of the things to remember is if you use these, it's best to make multiple turns through that uh, ferrite because the impedance is N squared. So if you go through it one time, you just have the base impedance. If you go through it twice, it's four times the impedance. And if you can make three passes through that ferrite, it's nine times the base impedance. That's pretty uh, significant. I always try and get at least two or three through it, depending on how much cable I have available. If you want to learn more about ferrites, Jim Brown, K9YC, you can go to his website. It is fantastic. I mean, you can spend a week there reading about all the stuff he's worked on and experimented with, and it's just phenomenal. He's put a huge amount of work into it. Uh, you'll probably only want to go there one, one evening because beyond that, it just gets overwhelming. There's so much stuff, uh, really interesting stuff to... Uh, to consider, but uh, he's got some great ideas. So uh, since I use ferrites quite a bit, um, I store them in some old peanut butter containers. Works out good. I always have a supply on hand if I go out uh, on an issue of some kind, I bring them with me because you just no telling what you're gonna run into and these can be the solution in some cases. So uh, results. Here's what my noise floor looked like when I first started two different days. The blue was not too bad of a day. It was back uh, 2016 in September. I had S3, worst case. But then uh, the next month, 
when the weather got cold, the red line noise went up. Usually happens in the fall time when things get cold and dry. Things were horrible. And uh, about two years later, here's what my noise floor looked like. My objective was a S2, and I actually achieved better than S2 in all directions. A little bit of an increase here, maybe uh, three or four dB in a couple of directions, but uh, quite workable. I mean, I, this was a huge improvement over what I had. A few um, non power line noise source, noise sources, some things I've run across that really were odd things. Uh, in one case, it was a drifting fuzzy carrier about five kilohertz wide that would drift across 80, the top end of 80 meters. That turned out to be a desktop PC power supply. It was quite a distance away, like 400 feet uh, at a neighbor's house. Uh, not my neighbor's house, but another, another ham's uh, house. I've run across um, three different cases now of switching mode power supplies for multicolored light strings that were causing noise. And I just had one about two months ago or so. And in two of the cases, it was the teenager in the house had multicolored light string in their, their bedroom. And in one of the cases, at least, the light string was off, but the power supply was plugged in and it was creating uh, all kinds of noise. In this case, it was creating what sounded like a variable speed motor, like a AC compressor motor that can change speeds. And that's what I thought it was. But working with my neighbor, uh, it turned out that uh, using the, the circuit breaker test, it was not that. It came from the upstairs bedroom. He went up there, started unplugging things, and got to the uh, light string. And he says, well, it's not on, but I'll unplug it and it went away but I've now had three cases. So that's something to keep an eye out for LED light strings. Uh, another interesting thing, uh, DSL is disappearing, but uh, it can be very noisy. I ran across the problem and it was distinguishable because uh, I think it was, so I think below, below 3.75 megahertz, there was no noise and above 3.75 megahertz, there was intense noise. So that was the, the place where it transitioned from downlink to uplink frequencies in the, in the uh, telephone cable pair. And there ended up being two problems. Uh, one was a broken wire in a pair, so it was acting not like a twisted pair, uh, you know, which provides pretty good RF suppression. It was acting like a one wire antenna. And the other one, the tech said it was improperly wired. So I think it was a split pair where they used one wire out of one pair and one wire out of another pair. And of course, it's not really a twisted pair anymore, and those will radiate. He found those quite quickly, <clears throat> did an excellent job. <clears throat> Another one was a, a solar ray, which we don't have many in the Southeast, but some clubs in Australia have major problems with, uh, with uh, solar rays. They, they don't have power line problems, they have solar ray problems. Other uh, thing that's kind of interesting, here's a, a power pole. This area was quite noisy. Spent a, a morning out uh, with the Yagi and my dish trying to find the source of the noise. Could not find the source of the noise, but every time I'd run Mapper, Mapper would tell me the noise is there. You need to find it. <laughs> Turns out it was the fence that runs below this power line. It was a very long fence and it, uh, the voltage was being induced from the power line above it because there's a strong electric field in that power line. And we we're talking 14,000 volts. So there's a, a weak magnetic field, but a relatively strong electric field. That electric energy was being induced in the vent, fence. Well, it's not normally a problem during moist weather when every one of these uh, uh, posts has a good ground. The ground is moist, good ground. They got like a ground rod basically, and the fence is being grounded every single uh, 10 feet. The wires are attached to it. But apparently when we get the dry spell in the fall, like we are now, the posts lose their ground. The ground is no longer wet and the energy in the wire has to travel a much longer distance to get to some point where it can go through this wire wrap joint 
to a vertical wire and then to another wire that eventually touches a post that is grounded. So by accident, I scanned the fence with my dish, just kind of, you know, scanning, looking for you know, flies and bugs and things that make noise. When I did that, I go, that's rather odd. And I scan it from multiple directions. And it turns out some of these joints, dozens, were making noise. And as soon as we get some rain, that problem goes away. So you get some really weird stuff sometimes you can't explain, but if you dig long enough, you'll eventually find the solution or the answer. And in this case, um, it was this, this corroded joint. This fence has been around a long time, but some uh, really odd stuff. So a summary for RFI locating. Um, step one is always clear your local area noise. I'm gonna borrow some terms from the computer industry, LAN, LAN, except we're not doing local area network, we're doing local area noise. Two easy ways to do that, circuit breaker test and use the 137 megahertz Yagi attenuator to locate uh, the noise inside your house or near your QTH. The range is, you know, like I said, about an eighth to a quarter mile or so. And if you'd like plans for that, just drop me a note. I'll be more than happy to send you a, a spreadsheet I have that describes on how to build those things. And the second thing, if it's a pole, a power line um, pole, you got to work with the power company. You're the RF expert. You know how RF works. The power company guys are really knowledgeable about power hardware, but they don't have a background in RF. So you have to be their kind of their ears and eyes on the RF side. You have to locate the pole and say, I think it's this pole. It matches what I'm hearing at home. And I can demonstrate that with the, uh, with the Yagi. So kind of keep that in mind. You're the, you're the pole expert. And then, uh, and I kind of liken a pole to the ethernet segment on a local area network. You're getting down to the NIC card, the actual hardware that's causing the problem. And then the third thing, um, if these don't fix your problems, you want to clear the wide area noise uh, rather than a wide area network, wide area noise. And you can use your AM car radio, or uh, if you really get into RFI hunting, you can use RFI mapper. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, maybe, maybe build a, a Yagi attenuate or do a little RFI hunting. If you have any questions when you travel down that road, uh, drop me a note. You can find me on uh, the QRZ webpage. Any uh, questions? Yeah, I guess I got one. Have you tried uh, using um, uh, one of these small dongled receivers uh, and interfacing your software to that? Say, um, uh, what is it? Uh, an SDR? SDR uh, place. Yeah, um, I did. I, I had one here uh, in my, my downstairs work area. But what I found was um, it makes things more complicated because you're trying to control um, RFI mapper software. At the same time, you're trying to control the SDR dongle software. And that's more complexity than I wanted when I'm driving. The, the Kenwood radio is so, so simple, so dumb. I just turn it on. You know, it's already set to 10 meters, has the right parameters. I don't have to set up a, um, with a dongle, you have to do a, a loopback uh, process to link COM ports together. There's no issue with those. With the, with the Kenwood, it's just a wire, you know, a cable, so to speak. But yeah, I played with it for a while and I just thought, I don't, it's, it's too complicated for a mobile setup. But I have used it uh, a number of times. They're really good if you have a noise that moves around. So I've powered it up here and connected it to my outside antennas where I can watch some of the things like ethernet uh, cables that make noise. So it's real handy for that. You know, if you don't have an SDR radio, like a flex or something like that, or a K3 with a pan adapter, you can use those dongles. And for a hundred dollars, they are pretty impressive receivers and very effective at, at locating a uh, spiky kind of noise. that's not wide band. Okay. Hey Jeff, I have kind of a similar question um, that you have to, one of the key things to run the mapper software you have to be able to read a signal level from the radio through through some means. Um, and so if you're trying to interface with like SDR software, that can get challenging on its own. But Jeff, my question for you was, are there any radios? I mean, I used like a 10 Tech Eagle to run your software some time back, which I've now unfortunately gotten rid of. Are there any other kind of smaller radios that have that kind of cat interface that you could that you can think of? 
Um, the Northeast has started up a prototype uh, RFI group, and they've standardized on 705s, IC 705s. Um, I added that radio to the software list. Uh, um, so that's a possibility. Pretty much any radio that does the standard uh, Kenwood uh, cat commands will work. Um, there's about four radios or five radios supported now. So the Kenwood TS 690, 450, that's supported. Um, the Elecraft uh, K3s are supported. Uh, IC705, I think there's an FT897 in there. I'd have to look at the list, but there's about five different ones that I've gotten my hands on where I could add the software when somebody asked for it. So uh, if you let me know what you have, that'd probably be the simplest thing. And, and maybe it's on the list of, of radios. The, the part of the problem is uh, the command to query the radio is pretty simple, but the radios report back differently. Like my Kenwood reports back in how many bars the S meter is illuminated. And I convert that to an S meter level. Some radios um, like the K3 report back just the S meter reading like four, five, six, seven. Um, so that, that works pretty well. It's six dB increments, but it works pretty well. Some radios report back a, a number between zero and 255 and you have to then translate that to an S meter reading. Um, there's all kinds of weird stuff. So there's no standardization as far as that S meter reading is, but uh, if you have something in particular, we could probably get it going. Have you ever um, worked with a spread, pardon me, a, um, oh geez, I can't believe I'm getting so silly now. Um, spectrum analyzer, one of those uh, smaller four inch ones. Um, I have a spectrum analyzer I use for specific problems, but I've not used it for RFI map or I've just kept it simple. Okay. Part of the appeal uh, initially, at least, uh, kind of led me down the road was uh, I used the Kenwood radio downstairs in my workshop just to listen to 20 meters and such. So I was real familiar with what's a bad noise source, what's a good noise source. And then when I transitioned that to the vehicle, it was it came in really handy from the standpoint of, OK, I know what bad is. I know how the radio responds to it or whatever. So there is kind of an advantage to use the same radio that you're familiar with. Um, in the vehicle and versus uh, uh, your home use. So if that's a possibility, that's, that's kind of good. One of the things you need to make sure when you put it in the vehicle, like don't run the noise blanker, right? You're trying to find noise. If you run the noise blanker, you're not gonna hear the noise. So that's one of the pitfalls. Also um, uh, make sure you don't have any attenuators in, you don't have the RF preamp on, you want just a kind of a neutral interpretation of what the, uh, the noise is. In AGC, make sure it's set to fast, not slow, because you don't want slow recovery as you pass a power pole. You want the radio to respond you know, quickly, reduce the level, um, kind of like the, the way it actually is. You don't want a delayed response, so to speak. So there's some things you learn when using your home radio, if you can apply those to the mobile setup. Yeah, I've at work at Process Control Corp. We uh, design uh, industrial equipment. Uh, in the industrial world, I run into a lot of conducted noise, um, and uh, both uh, due to static, because our industry is in the plastics industry, uh, we get a lot of static buildup where we move pellets around real fast. Yeah, uh, and also, uh, so you get conducted noise uh, or through the static hitting like load cells or proximity sensors um, and then power noise uh, from big inverters driving 200 horsepower motors or even your own uh, fractional motors. Uh, some of the, them might uh, generate noise you got to watch out for. I, I haven't run into a lot of RF issues, but then again, the industrial world is pretty well, often their stuff is well shielded uh, compared yeah. to home devices. Yeah, it's generally pretty well made uh, in metal shielding and the loads are so big sometimes load is uh, consumes a lot of power but if the load is a low resistance which it is when it consumes a lot it's pretty hard to generate too much differential uh, noise between those two conductors right because it's a big resistor hanging on the end so yeah anytime uh, something happens fast in the world 
uh, and electrical systems, you have, you know, this nice uh, wave that's uh, like a ethernet where data is going on and off and it's a very steep change when it goes from a zero to a one. Yeah. That's got a lot of harmonics in it. And, and sometimes you'll see ethernet signals uh, on your, your home radio uh, and typically 14, about 14.010 and four, or 28.020. Uh, just because things are happening fast and you, there's no such thing as a pure square wave, right? It's, it's a lot of harmonics in there to make that square wave. So. Yeah. Um, in the board design world, uh, I've used for IVs, uh, inductors, um, of course, parallel capacitance, uh, and depending on, you know, we're, we're trying to get like 20 bit resolution load cell readings. So, uh, <laughs> I'll throw the book of noise prevention at something to, try to uh, calm everything down. 20 bits is a lot. Yes, it is. It's very hard to achieve too. Yeah, some of the radios I work with, uh, Elecraft uh, has two modes. One mode is just a simple S meter reading. So it's S5, S6. 6 dB is a little more than you'd want for uh, RFI mapping. You like a little more granularity to the system but you, you get what you get and it still works okay. But in other cases, um, they put, you know, roll it down into half dB steps and you go, no, I don't need to map out 256 levels on a map to understand where the noise is. Something uh, much coarser than that is really what's wanted. So yeah. um, you see all kinds of stuff. Funny thing about noise, it can jump around a bit too. I had one customer site I had to go to to debug a noise problem and they literally had noise coming from a three-phase inverter on 460 and then they had a step-down transformer going to a UPS in 120 and, and what was going on is that they had like a, a computer terminal running on that line. <clears throat> now our equipment is only tied to it through like a RS-45 link and what it the noise was so bad, I was getting close to 50 volts of RF noise on the RS-45, and it was causing false key presses on the membrane switch uh, as far as the process of reading that keyboard, that membrane switch. And 50 so volts it, is a lot. Yeah, it, it was creating all kinds of char false characters. But um, ultimately, I used some uh, TBS or transorbs, the... Uh, transient diodes brought the clip clip the voltage down to about maybe six volts and uh that was enough for the 45 circuit to uh be able to clean up the rest hey jeff yes you, you mentioned the northeast pr uh, prototype rfi group and that they standardized on the um, ic705 could you maybe uh tell us a little bit more about that group and why they standardized on that particular radio yeah, they did that before I got involved. Uh, I did a presentation uh, maybe a year or so ago for them. And uh, they added me to their their email list. They, I think what's intended is they're, they're testing out a concept where each uh, ARRL division would have some kind of focal point for RFI issues. And then they'd have so, uh, like worker teams in each ARRL section. So they have like six or seven sections or maybe eight sections up in the, in the Northeast. They all roll up to a division director, um, but they're structuring this and they're buying equipment for the individual teams. They're using the IC705. Uh, so it's relatively small, it's battery operated. Um, it's not too expensive um, and it seems to work okay. Uh, I found the rig decent to work with. The only thing I didn't like, it uses a uh, micro USB connector, which I found to be a little uh, uh, not robust. I mean, if you moved it around enough, uh, you'd lose connection to the radio, which then the RFI mapper software is going to stop, of course, because the radio is not there anymore. But that's the only negative I saw was that USB micro connection. I'd rather see you know, something more robust than that. But it's a good little radio, worked pretty well. I borrowed one from a gentleman down in Swanee area to do the testing with that. What would your ideal radio be? Um, I'd like a Kenwood TS-450 uh, that's not so big and heavy. 
Um, that radio works fantastic for RFI hunting. It does not like power line noise. So when I approach a power line source, I mean, it, it, it just really affects the audio uh, and it makes it very obvious. It really jumps up. The Elecraft um, works okay too, the K3, but it's more forgiving, which is an operator, you'd want that. But if you're trying to locate power line noise, you really don't want that. You want something that doesn't like, you know, and, and it's really noisy when you get near a power line. But you can pick up the TS450s or the 690s, that includes six meters, you know, for like $400 or $500 now. And a K3 is good if you have one of those laying around or you know, it was kind of whatever you have, a 705. Um, there's one of the ASUS I had, I think it was an 897. That's another possibility. And 705, I saw those uh, $1,300. That's, that's a good investment to standardize on for something, you know, you're going to, I guess, use it as a piece of equipment, not right. radio. I'll tell you what, um, Jeff brought a 705 up to Buck Bald a couple of years ago when we were doing Tennessee QSO party. And I was, I was a little skeptical. It's an expensive QRP radio. We're, we're going to kind of get off noise here for a second. Um, I, he had some trouble with his antennas and I was helping him. And the very first contact he made on that radio with 10 Watts was a station up in Maine. And it absolutely sounded beautiful. And I started rethinking QRP radios because of that 705. It's a, it's a nice little radio. Uh, one of the things I tell the guys, I've, I've been doing portable setting up in parks and, and whatnot long before there was a POTA. Um, we went over to, it's a park in Atlanta. It's just off Holcomb Bridge Road, right before you cross over the river from uh, Peachtree Corners into, into Roswell. And great park, nice trees, nice place to park, easy to walk the radios in. But the problem was there was some kind of RFI in there. You guys that were there will remember it. It was about this time of year. And every radio we had was completely desensed. You could not hear a 20-meter radio on another 20-meter radio 15 feet away. Absolutely desensed. But there was no noise. There was no static, no loud anything. It just desensed every single radio. So, from so no buzz, no buzz, no nothing. It's just like, it was just dead. Even the two meter radios didn't seem to work real hmm. and it never did figure out what it was, but I added to my toolbox because of that trip. Cause I looked at the park along with, uh, I think it was KF4 UPO that found it. And I looked at it and I said, this is great. There's tables, there's benches, there's nice convenient trees. And, uh, so I added to my toolbox, something you mentioned earlier on, uh, I've got an, an AM radio from probably 1980 that I paid $3 for at a ham fest. And that's in my radio kit. When I go to a new park, the first time I'll walk around that radio tuned to no station and just hear what I can hear. Buzzes and hums you expect. Uh, I did take it back over to this park and walk through it. And it descends to the point where there was not even white noise on the radio. Most astounding was, thing I'd ever heard. Was there an AM transmitter nearby or an FM or TV station? No, not supposed to be. I mean, if you if you threw a rock westward from this park, it would go in the river. Uh, what I did see on the other side of the river looked like maybe a fire department, a fire station. So it's possible. But anyway, it was something you said early on about having an AM radio to spot the noise, that, that to me is a low-hanging fruit, but it works. Yeah, usually on descents problems like that that are so severe, I think about uh, like TV stations that are running uh, a million watts ERP. Um, there is so much energy there. It almost doesn't matter how much padding you have. If you get too close to the main beam of that thing, it's just going to desense any radio. Enough signal will leak through uh, and get to the inners of the radio and maybe directly or maybe it'd be the antenna. Uh, yeah, one, it, was, it, it, it was it was pretty severe. And in fact, I thought the bands were just dead. <laughs> until until we said you know and one of the guys said maybe it's my radio so we put them both on 20 meters and the antennas couldn't have been more than 15 20 feet apart nothing absolutely nothing coming so they were they were it's the worst i've ever seen uh anybody got any other questions uh oh there's nothing other than to say that was an awesome presentation thank you did, yeah. did we did we lose our presenter oh um i'm still here i think yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. My screen just went, uh, I, I lost everything here for some reason. What's going on? Oh, there my, it is. Okay. My, my intent is to, uh, hopefully make people a little more knowledgeable on how to approach RFI problems. If you have any questions you think I can help with, drop me a note. You can find okay. my uh, address, but from what I'm seeing, if I look at my history here, we're all going to have RFI problems because I see so many devices coming into homes. Uh, even around my neighborhood, I now have three different weird sources that float across the 10 meter spectrum. They're, they're variable in frequency. It started about five years ago with one source. I don't know if it's like a solar charger for maybe yard lights, but I started with one source to the southeast. I now see a source to the north somewhere, and I see a source to the southwest. I'm going, if this continues, we're all going to be going to have to become RFI hunters because there's going to be so many things generating noise, and we're going to have to get really good at finding it. Yeah, so many little things. Uh, you know, if it's like a power pole, you can call the power company if you can identify it. But, you know, if if my six neighbors have, like you said, solar cell chargers for the lights next to their driveway, how in the world are you going to track all that down? And if you do, what's what is there any recourse other than sneaking out at night and stealing them? I mean, that's not advised, by the way, guys. Yeah, what I tell everybody is stay good friends with your neighbors when they need help uh, if they're doing something out along the road and you see they are struggling offer to help and become friends because someday you will need your your friends your yeah. neighbors and i found that's worked really well in a couple of cases matter of fact my next door neighbor just moved in and he's got some noisy garage lights that just trash 10 meters they happen to be eight foot tube led tubes well guess what eight feet is a quarter wavelength on 10 meters yeah. And it, it just kills that man like by 15 or yep. 20 dB. But he I, says, I, I'd like to replace those. So he had a, a, a four of another kind that his daughter gave him their, their canopy lights or maybe about a foot and a half by a foot and a half. He gave one to me to try and says, see if this is better. It's like a world better off the back of it. It's a metal case off the back. There's no radiation I can detect or maybe one dB off the front it's maybe like 7 db but that's it um literally five feet away so if i wasn't good friends with them uh that wouldn't wouldn't happen you know we wouldn't that's, trust one another so that's pretty good I, I may have my own adventure coming up here uh we have a lot of deer in the neighborhood i'm in and i like to feed the birds in the winter and the deer like to get into the corn and uh, eat the bird seeds so I was thinking about putting three strands of an electric fence around my, my bird feeders. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of worried about that generating a lot of noise, but Hey, cross that bridge. When we come to it. Um, anybody else got any more questions and we'll, we'll let got, the man go get some sleep. Yeah. I got a go question. Um, so, you know, this is for Jeff, uh, what kind of equipment uh, do they use for the net looking for uh, signals at the national radio quiet zone? You know, that's, I guess the top, the mm. top, the oh, top yeah. equipment out there i'm just curious what it is um the only experience i have with the uh, quiet zone is when i worked in cellular up in uh, virginia um, there was a site in uh, north of blacksburg where uh, virginia tech is and they were extremely strict <laughs> and i don't know what they have but they don't want any noise anywhere near it and we had to submit plans matter of fact we had to take a vertical antenna Normally you have this nice uh, lobe that goes on the horizon, right? Because you want to cover stuff out farther. The only way we could turn the site up is we had to tilt that antenna at about a 30 degree angle so that the first null would go towards the RA, uh, NRAO site that was up in uh, Green, Green Bank, I think it was. Um, but they have extremely sensitive receivers and uh, it doesn't take long for them to find you if you have an issue that uh, is interfering with their reception. Yeah, I know that's they're pretty, pretty cool. They're pretty uh, strict about that. It's not because of NRAO. That, I guess that's the public, the public thing. There's an NSA site about a mile and a half from there and that's what they're, that's what they're protecting. Oh, okay. You're not supposed to know that though, Rob. I know. I'm going to be <laughs> midnight. <laughs> so they'll get this recording and come looking for you. you won't know how you knew that. All right, guys. Do we have, 
Do we have any? Oh, yeah. And, and now there's like 50 Starlink satellites crossing over at any given hour over the site. So that's going to be another issue. Uh, any more questions, guys? One last one for me. Um, what other noise sources have, can you think of that you have found? Well, I think they fall into two classes. So one is power line noise, and there's all kinds of hardware. That's a high voltage arc problem. And then there's uh, switching mode power supplies or something related to them. Um, if you go beyond that, uh, anything that has a CPU in it or data, and that's a different kind of noise, uh, usually this SMPSs are buzz related. You'll listen to them and they'll sound like they're buzzing. But you'll also see if you get close to uh, a monitors, uh, CPUs of some kind, it's more of a hissing noise. And sometimes you think that's band noise. It's not because if you point that 137 megahertz Yagi at it, it increases, you've pointed away, it goes away. That's actually you know data transmission inside the unit, very fast data transmission, just mm -hmm. creating like a fog. So be aware of that also. It could be you know something that you wouldn't, you listen to it and you go, that's not a problem. Well, it is if it raises your noise floor, you know, 15 or 20 dB. Bill, Bill found a, uh, a noise sauce. He didn't mention um, a Wimhurst generator, right? Right, right Bill, at, at the science fair. Oh, yeah, that was, yeah, that was lack of planning on their part. Uh, they, they had a spark, um, one of those static electricity generators, and they wanted us to do HF. Mm -hmm. and, and it was almost the same principle. As soon as they would just turn that crank, you just turn the radios off because you yep. couldn't get you couldn't get hits on them. But uh, that's I think that's the last time I the last time I carried anything over there and set up if they're going to have that machine around because what's the point? All right, anything else? So All as right. we as we enter uh, Christmas season, uh, we're going to see a proliferation of wall warts and LED lights. We will. So yeah, so we should expect uh, some some troubles. And the Christmas tree on the mountain used to clobber the W4 BOC machine up there. It knocked it completely out. But I think they've done something about that, like take it off the mountain or something. Yeah, keep your eyes open for things that happen right around Thanksgiving, because that's an indication it's a Christmas season event. And some of those LED light strings are not very uh, friendly to, uh, to yeah. radio. Yeah, my neighbor put his up, and he leaves them up all year, but he doesn't turn them on until Thanksgiving. And uh, I know my <laughs> two meter radio; I can I can hear them on two meters here. So, but well, like I say, he's he's I should say she she's a nice lady. We're good friends. I'm not going to go over and bitch at her. Yep, stay friends with your neighbors. That's there you go. Uh, and start early because uh, you may not need them today or next week, but by next summer you may. All right, well, well, relationships. Last call. Any more questions? Yeah, I've got one. Jeff, can we get a, a copy of the slides? Sure. Yeah, I can send you like a PDF or something like that. Yeah. Um, all I ask is you don't post them publicly, but for club members, uh, no problem. Yeah, we've we've done that before. Yeah. That's for club we'll, we'll take care of it. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank one you. last call. Any questions? <laughs> try try to let the man go at a reasonable hour here, guys. Yeah. You. you you will have questions in the next couple of months. I'm, I'm sure I'll get several emails from folks. I always do, because now that you're more aware of RFI, you're going to go, hey, that's RFI. You know, what do I do about it? And it's you're, not in the normal categories I talked about tonight. So I, I saw your email on the presentation. We are free to email you if we keep it reasonable, correct? Correct. Okay. <laughs> that, sounds good. that sounds pretty good. You heard that, Rob. Keep it reasonable. Thank you for your presentation. It it was a good one. Thank you. Yes. Good night. Happy good. RFI hunting. Good night, guys. <laughs> All right. Do we do we have any club business we need to cover before we shut down? Remember, next meeting will be the Christmas party, and we're kind of up in the air on whether we're going to do anything on November twelfth or thirteenth, whatever that second Sunday is. Kind of up in the air at this point. Any other club business? I don't hear anybody jumping up. So, uh, John, are you going to be at the club table most of Saturday at the Hamfest? Yeah, I'll be there all weekend, Saturday okay. and Sunday. 
Okay, I, I'll be in Saturday. I just got a letter from the guys up in Chat or an email from the guys up in Chattanooga right before the meeting. Uh, I was trying to arrange to go up and pick up. Uh, by the way, in case let everybody know, I won the grand prize at the Chattanooga Ham Fest, which is an ICOM seventy three hundred. And I told the guys I'd like to come up and pick it up rather than have them ship it. And he said, "Great, we can take a picture for the for the website." And I said, "Okay, everybody's happy." Uh, they're going to bring it down Saturday to the club table. So if I'm not there, you got my phone number, call me. I don't want them to take it back just because I'm standing over there talking to people at the cards table or something. All right, All right man. All right, that's it. We'll call this you meeting close. Sign on it. Do what? You want us to put a for, for sale sign on it? I was I was thinking John and I will talk. I may actually donate it back to our club and make it the grand prize at the Ham Fest. That'd be nice. That that will save us having to having to pony out for one, but I'm not sure. We'll, we'll talk about it and see how that works out. I had just arranged to sell my 7300. Uh, I, I talked to a guy at our Tuesday dinner, and I told him I wanted to buy an FTDX 10 this year for Christmas, and I probably sell the 7300. And I was going to throw it out to the entire Tuesday dinner group, and he said how much, and I gave him a number. He said I'll take it. So I sold it to him on Tuesday and then won and won one on Saturday. And uh, one of the one of the ladies I know made a comment when I mentioned this. Well, I got another one, and she says the universe just wants you to have a seventy three hundred, doesn't it? I said maybe that's the case. I don't know. Maybe there's a plan behind this. <laughs> so don't 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 spit in the eyes of the gods if they grant you a gift. You you smile and take it. So didn't look. somebody at our Amfest, John? They they bought what was it a seventy one hundred, and then they won. The seventy one hundred. I had to get a call him on the way back. Say, hey, you won a race. Yeah, it, yeah, it yeah. That did happen. I remember that. So anyway, he's going to bring it by the table. They want to take a picture. So I just go tell John that you know if, if I'm not at the table, holler at me, and we'll be close. I'll find you. All right, guys, that's it. Next meeting will be at the uh, 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 Jeff. Do you live local? Are you close? I am uh, up in Forsyth County, uh, between close Cumming and Gainesville. Close enough. Uh, the next first Thursday of next month will be our Christmas party. Why don't you come to the Mad Italian restaurant, bring your your significant other, and we'll treat you to dinner. Well, let me take a look at the calendar. Um, oh. We've got a bunch of family stuff going on, of course, and uh, grandkids and all that. Yeah. Well, well, we'll think of you as family if you come. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Good night, guys. Good night. Pull the plug on this one. Good night, Thanks everybody. Too. Bye.